Hey everybody, Jeff here again, and hey, we got a really great treat for you today. Today we're going to show you how to tear down this kitchen wall here, and we're going to make an open concept kitchen to make the whole area here from the kitchen to the dining room look a lot better. So what we're going to do is we will show you how to make this knee wall here. So this is called a knee wall when they make the wall come up only about this high here. And so we have to tear out this whole section here. We are going to show you everything about how to do the demo, how to cut through the studs, how to move the wires if we need to, and then how to build up the support for it and put the granite in place and how to patch up the drywall and everything. And we're going to show you how to make your property look like a million bucks because nothing looks better than seeing a nice big wide open concept here when people walk in the door. So this is very typical of condos, and let me show you what we're talking about here. You walk in the door, the front door, and you're faced with this big wall here that's just blocking this beautiful new kitchen we put in, right? So ideally, when you have buyers coming in to look at your place, and they open that front door, you want them to be able to see from the front all the way to the back, and it will look a lot bigger, brighter, and better. I mean, why hide this beautiful kitchen with this ugly old stale narrow door i mean look at this can you imagine seeing from the front door all the way straight out through this pass-through window here so this is the kitchen that we just put in here and it's got a you know pass-through window and we you know, put in a whole nice backsplash and everything but let's look at the back side of that wall that we were just discussing here so that's what it looks like here so here's where we just walked in from the foyer. And it's just basically a, a blank wall here going up. And there's not much they can do there either because see your refrigerator's here and you can't put a 24 inch cabinet there because it would come out to here. There's just not enough room in these smaller kitchens. If the builder had just given them one extra foot, it would be possible. So what we're going to do here then is we're just gonna leave a wall here and we'll cut the opening in here, okay? And we can see already we're going to have to move this foam line here. And it will be nice and open coming into the kitchen here. And here's the other side of the kitchen counter here, the base cabinet. Okay, so we have to decide, well, how tall do we want this knee wall to be? So there's two possibilities here. One of them is we could make it the same height as, as this here. So our counter here is a, is a typical one, as you can see. It, it comes in at 36 inches here, as you can see right there, uh, which means that the top of the cabinet is really at about you know, 34 and a half or so. So we could make the wall 34 and a half inches. Go ahead. Okay, so there's a couple of complications here because if we do make it 34 inches, now we have to move this outlet switch here. Uh, uh, the, this is the light switch for the kitchen. That has to get moved if we do that. Uh, so an idea that I like better is, let's say the new owner comes in and they buy some uh, narrow depth countertop that uh, may, I don't know, we don't know what, what height it'll come in at, um, but it'd be better if we had a little bit of a wall on top of it here, and then you put the counter right here. So I like the idea of putting it at about 40 inches height for the wall here. And I'll show you an example of that. So if you look here at our sink, what we did here was we built out this whole box out. So this window was wider. It, it, it was like practically over to here. We had to box it out a little more to accommodate this corner cabinet. But you see this six inch backsplash here behind the, the sink here? This riser, we built that because the builder originally just had a counter here that came straight out and went straight out towards the the patio there in a bar and it, it was just really dumb and tacky looking. But giving you this extra height here allows you to, you know, put stuff in front of it and everything. So if we do something like that similar on this side, it'll allow them, if they put in cabinets or something, they could stop the cabinets right here by the switch and work their way this way. And then if we gave them like a six inch wall on top of that, 
and then they can put their counter uh, like a you know granite piece we will put on top of that for them that will allow them to stack stuff on top of their, their counters there so I think that's what we'll do we'll go with that 40 inch height and your situation might be different you may have different needs but uh, we think this will be the best course of action all right so we have the lines all marked you can see across the top down the side and down the bottom and that's the part we're going to cut out now we're using our Sonicrafter, the oscillating tool, just to cut through the drywall without penetrating into the wall. So the drywall is pretty much off there now and we can see nicely into the kitchen. So the only thing we got to worry about is finding a home for these wires. They're going to have to be rerouted probably down below here. Okay, so we have this part of the wall here that's wobbling. You can see really bad how much it wobbles. It's just terrible. All right, so there's not much support in it. And, you know, this is what happens when you have a wall that's, that comes out this far like this. And all you have is these metal studs there, see, right there. Metal studs are good. They're strong, but they're very bad for torsional strength. They twist easily. They're not like solid wood. And even if you had solid wood here, this wall would still be wobbly. Why? Because there's nothing to stop this direction, this left to right direction. Yeah, it's rock solid up and down. It's not going to move anywhere on you. And you can block it in and, and maybe uh, try to help it some there too. Um, but I'm thinking more along the lines of what would you do like on a dock where you have all of those you know those dock posts those pier posts that go down into the water something that's rock solid that doesn't move that's what keeps the docks uh, okay so here's an idea I've got and maybe you can let us know down in the comments below whether you agree with this but here's what I'm thinking I've got this half inch by 36 inch galvanized pipe here okay and it's threaded on both ends right and keep in mind if you take a look at what our mechanical structure is here we have a stud here the switches are here and another stud here and the wiring for the switch is just going to go straight across and go through that grommet back to the fuse panel so what I'm thinking is this down there at the bottom that's a metal plate the metal plate is made of the same material as this metal stud here in most condos and apartment buildings here in Florida anyway you have cement slabs in between your floors so they usually use metal studs and, and floor plates the base plate your bottom plate is metal the same metal that the stud is made out of so what I want to do is go down to the bottom of the floor and mount one of these threaded flanges here at the bottom and remember it's concrete so let me just demonstrate for you what we're going to do It'll mount at the bottom there into the concrete. And then this threaded rod will screw into it like this. See? So all we do is screw it in like that. And then we'll have a perfectly solid support pier here. So the thing is, okay, so you got a threaded pipe sticking out of the floor. Now what? How are you going to mount or strap anything to this? What are you going to do? So here's what we're going to do here for this. So we get a second flange, okay, and this second one here 
he's going to just screw right to the top of the rod and so that's what it's going to look like and this will hold this will be rock solid because it's mounted with tapcon screws to the cement slab at the bottom and then at the top we have the second flange all right so what's going to happen is this piece of wood right here we usually put a wide piece of wood on the top here when we're done when we're done with all of our adding our wood studs and sistering them to the metal studs in there and then we can screw this down on top of the wood studs so this will be our our top plate here and then the granite countertop is going to go right along the top here okay so what we do then is this now will screw onto the bottom but of course the top plate is a couple of inches taller than this so we will have to put a couple of pieces of wood blocking until we get up to this point right here and once they're all screwed in together structurally they'll be sound and they'll all be connected to this rigid pier you know this galvanized pipe here will be like our our, um, our dock by the sea that with the pylons into the water so it's going to act like that for us and that will stabilize this wall so it may not look like much to you but because it's a nice uh, it's not a solid pipe but it's very very thick and it's not going anywhere and I tell you once we put this in place this will hold this wall and it will solve the problem of wobbling okay now my rigid support pier rod here that I'm going to put in inside the wall and mount it to the floor uh, we're going to need access down in that part so we're probably going to cut about a 12 inch hole out of this drywall here in order to get in there, we need to be able to get in with the drill and drill our holes for the tap cons that are going to screw that into the, the floor there, the cement slab inside the wall. And we got to make sure we're only going to use tap cons that are about an inch long. There's no reason to go way deep. And you don't want to risk poking into something else either that could be in the slab. You just don't know. So it's best to go as short as possible and still make a good connection. All right, so we cut the bottom of the drywall out, pull it out there, and we're going to clean up this underneath there, and that's where this flange here will get screwed in. So there's our bottom hole cleaned out, and don't throw away your piece that you cut off here, because this piece right here will go right back when we're done. We'll put some wood backing around it inside, and there's no need to even cut a new piece. This will go right back intact. Okay, so we've cut out a, a space there on the bottom plate, and it's okay, the bottom plate's not compromised because there's still a Hilti fastener here going right into the concrete, and there's one over here too. So you needed to have access directly to the concrete so we can screw this down. We'll anchor it down with the tap cons. Okay, so we have our four holes marked. And we're going to drill with a concrete bit. We have our bit set to a depth that's a quarter of an inch longer than the end of the tap con screws. Whenever I drill into concrete, I always vacuum out the hole. four tap cons in place. The base flange is now secure. You can see here they never bonded the metal box to ground with a ground screw here. That's a violation of the National Electric Code right there. Totally messed this up. This would be a perfect time if you haven't already to hit the subscribe button down below. And once you hit that subscribe button, you'll see that little gray bell. Click on that, and that will alert you to every time we put a new video so that you'll never miss a video. And also, if you like our video here, you can click on the thumbs up button down below. That lets us know that you like us. And any questions you have, please enter them in the comments down below, too. Okay, so here we are the next morning. And what we have done here at the bottom, um, last night before we left... I stuck a bunch of PL adhesive in here, all the way around here. 
and tried to force it down into where the threads go just to make sure things are a little more solid and, and it helped out a little bit. So there's two problems with our solution here that, that I don't really like. Um, first of all, the flanges that we could find have just a narrow neck that only stick up about a half inch. So yeah, you screw it in, but to me that's not enough to hold enough threads to keep it stable enough at the bottom. And on top of that, the thread still wiggles a teeny bit when it's screwed all the way in, even though we use our robo grips. So what we like to do is when we connect these pipes up, we use our robo grips and just tighten it as much as it'll possibly turn. And even then, it's still going to be somewhat loose because the threads aren't perfect. And uh, so we threw some of this PL in here to solidify it, and it did help uh, quite a bit. But we still recommend that you go with a one-inch pipe and the, and the equivalent size flange here so that the pipe can thread into it and it'll be even more rigid because there's still some play up at the top and I'll show you here. So here's our pipe up top. You can see it's still wiggling a teeny bit, not a lot. Nowhere near as much as it was. But you're not going to get perfection because the threads down at the bottom there are just not perfect. So I would say going with the bigger one inch pipe and what you do is on the threads of the pipe before you put it in here, I want you to ooze a whole bunch of PL adhesive on there and then screw it in. So it'll be completely locked in tight and rigid and won't move. But once you do that, you put it in. Walk away from it, don't touch it, don't move the wall, don't do anything, let it cure overnight. So it will remain um, nice and rigid. Okay, so now to stabilize the rest of the wall here, you see how you have this? Well, this is what helps your wall move. So by putting an end to this kind of flexion, we're going to put some wood blocking in here. That will help stabilize this a lot more and the wall won't have any reason to... See how it kind of moves a little bit too? And watch this, watch that wire right there. You can see how it kind of jiggles a bit there because all of this is moving, see? As long as all this is moving here, you're gonna have flexion in the wall. So once we block all of this perimeter frame here with, with uh, wood stud pieces that we're going to cut and fit in there, and we'll screw them in right through the drywall. Remember, this is not a structural wall. This is not a load-bearing wall. That, there's, it's fine doing it that way. So what I have here is I have a piece of wood here already cut that will fit into this side here. And it will make everything just rock solid. And if you want, you can even glue and, and screw them in too. But I think screwing it in will be probably just fine. Okay, so we disconnected the wire from that outlet box up there. Pulled it out of the ceiling. So this is the first of three of the vertical wires to get yanked. So this comes down into the switch box where it feeds in a white wire, a black wire here, and a ground wire, a bare copper wire that's in the back there. So all we have to do is disconnect this white wire out of that connector. We'll disconnect the black wire here off my Wago connector that I put here. And then we'll get rid of the ground wire too. And then we can pull this whole piece of Romex because we won't need it anymore because we have a whole roll of 14-2 cable that we have to run from this box through the wall, up the wall here, and then back over to the box. So we're essentially, we're recreating this circuit that we just disconnected. We're just rerouting it. It's taking a detour. Okay, so <clears throat> we've opened up the wall around the builder's original box. We had to pop out three of the knockouts on the right side, two on the left. And because all of the wires that get rerouted are going to come through here. So this wire here, this vertical, second vertical wire, is the kitchen ceiling light. It will now run from the light switch across the wall, up the wall, across the soffit, through that yellow grommet right there and into the connector where it'll pass through the box and wire in to the other light, the other wire that comes right up to the light. So that's, so I have it all marked where, what's gonna go where. This third vertical wire that we have to get rid of here 
is going to come in and pass through the left side here. It goes to the patio light. And we will run that cord through the wall, down the wall, across the wall, and back to the light switch. Now coming back up to the outlet box, you can see the builder messed up because all they did was put two screws here and this whole box was flopping. So they stuck this block back here and screwed into the block. Now it's rock solid, it won't go anywhere. And they never grounded this box to the system ground. It was never bonded, so we have to put a ground screw right there and do that. And also, when you, we put these connectors in, you always make sure your screws are facing forward so when you're done, you can tighten them down. You can reach them very easily to tighten them down. Okay, so I pulled these out of that switch box. This is for the patio light, so this is now going to go get fed back up top there. And so here it is, it's, it's now been fed up. So we have two out of the three vertical power wires are gone now. So he's fed up in, into this box here and we'll just wait on routing the, no, the other 14-2 cable back down the wall, down to the switch, taking the detour. Okay, so now we are about to remove here the last of the electrical cables that was blocking us. So. This is the feed that goes up to the kitchen lights. Those are our LED wafer lights up there in the ceiling. All right, so we're gonna reroute this wire now and we're gonna put it back up in here and it's gonna pop out and go right up there where it says kitchen light. Yeah, and here we are, it's up in its position here. And then we'll run a 14-2 cable from there, down the wall, across the wall and back to the switch. Okay, so I've already started to route the first wire and this is gonna be for the dining room light. So remember, it's gonna mount as a sconce here to this outlet box here. And so you can see I've started to run the 14-2 cable and it's going through the wall and down. And it's coming around there. <clears throat> you can see it popping out right there. And so we're going to run it in through, you see the little hole there on the side of the the box there, the outlet box, with the switch box right back in there. It's going to go in there and hook up to the switch. Okay, so now here on the kitchen side, <clears throat> what we have here is this set of three wires here is the main line from the fuse panel. This is the main 120 volts that's coming to supply power to the kitchen switch, the light switch, and to the dining room light switch right here. So it'll connect up to our switch and then it'll turn around and go right back out the box again to the next location, which of course is over here and up the wall to the box up here. Remember our junction box. So this is the second detoured wire and it pops out over here. So this is going to go right to our patio light. So we're going to be wiring it this pair here to there. Okay, so one improvement I wanted to make here over what the builder did. They didn't do an adequate job with the grounding here. So you can see what I did with the main line ground. See that copper wire that's coming in to the box? I'm sending it right through the back hole there to the dining room light box next to it. So it's, going, it's coming in this box and going through there, right? So let me show you what's going to happen on the other side here. So I bring it into the dining room box. And the first thing we do with it, you can see back there, we wrap it around the ground screw. See it back there on the, on the back of the box there? And then, of course, we have the green pigtail, which takes us to uh, the ground on this switch here for the dining room light. So now both boxes are bonded together. And more importantly, both boxes are now bonded to the system ground that arrived to us from the fuse panel. That was our line voltage. So this is the proper way to ground a metal box. If you have a metal box like this, you have to bond it to the system ground, and that's the ideal way to do it. So now all the other ground wires that are gonna come into uh, these two boxes, we're going to just tie them all together at this one point here. All right, so now also coming in uh, this wire here, this black wire here, uh, he's coming in from the kitchen side outlet. That's the line, this is the, this black is supposed to be 120 here. And we're going to connect it to the switch. They'll be connected together with my Wago nut there. And it goes into the switch and then comes out the other side of the switch. 
and continues on to this black wire here, which was that first Romex cable that you saw me install there, and it runs up top to the light box up there. So that white cable that's sticking out up there, the Romex cable, that's where it's gonna go. That's gonna go to the dining room light. All right, now over here on the kitchen side of the action here, uh, what you can see you've got here is the 120 line voltage comes right here and then we're going to tap off of it and make it go right straight back out the cable and this goes up as a daisy chain to the next location which of course is back up the wall and up to our junction box where it's going to go and follow the patio lights um, it has to go on to power them so those go there so the only other black wire we need to worry about is this one here this goes to the other end of the switch because this this Romex set right here is going to the kitchen ceiling light. So all we got to do is plug in the black wire here. All the copper grounds from all these different circuits are going to connect together and twist together. And all of the whites, all of the neutrals are going to connect together as well. And we'll show you that in a second. All right, so there's our final mess here. It's all organized and everything's all tied down. We have a black and a white pair up here for the um, kitchen lights. You can see that line going off up to the kitchen ceiling. And then you have the middle pair here is our line voltage, which is daisy chaining and going off to the patio lights. And then you have this final pair here, white and black, that are for the sconce light that are going to get mounted right here for the dining room. And all the grounds are tied together there, the copper wires. And that's it for this. Let's see how it looks. All right, so now we have the front plate of this outlet box on and we're getting ready to install our sconce light once we patch all this up. So patching up is coming next. And it's hard to believe that this took about five hours of work to do all of this stuff and rerouting all the electrical cables here, the Romex cables that all down through the wall here and dealing with a huge mess in these two uh, switch boxes here because this was a major hub between the dining room lighting and the kitchen lighting and the patio lighting and, and other stuff that was going on in here and then trying to route wires up into this dangerous area inside the wall and this by the way is not a standard width wall they only use like two and a half inch wide studs so getting your hand back up in there and trying to force the wires through the grommet way up high was a nightmare And I've already patched up the drywall there in front of our outlet. I've got the first layer done. Second layer will go on in about a half hour once this quick set stuff. This is the 20 minute mud that I use. So once this dries, then we can start working on uh, finishing the cabinet blocking here in this knee wall. Now here's another cause of the wobbling walls here. So if you look at the bottom plate here, of a, this is a metal stud wall. See, it's really thin gauge metal, but you see it's flexing. You see that? I can move it, and that's part of the reason. So if this flexes, and we, are, we already know that big sheets of drywall flex, the whole wall's going to move. So one of the things we want to do here in an uh, effort to help us also reduce the movement of this wall is we're going to take this wood block here, and we're going to run it down the channel. I've already sliced it and everything, so it's going to run down that channel, and then we're going to screw it in through the drywall, through the metal stud, and into the, into the wood. It's going to go through that metal base plate there, right straight into our wood stud. And the wood, this piece right here, this piece of wood is a lot sturdier than that metal. So that's, uh, that's a, essentially we're doing cabinet blocking at this point. So that will also minimize any movement in the, in the walls. Okay, now as we're placing our plates across the top here well you're probably wondering why didn't you just do one plate well because there's a metal stud right here in the middle so we're doing it as two pieces and then we're screwing it in also from the side of through the metal stud here and then underneath we did one of the studs through the side as well so the thing to remember is of course make sure it's level side to side so this first piece went in level and then what I always do is I put a screw in on either end of the other piece whenever I'm doing this. And 
That way you can pull it up either with your hand or with a pair of pliers. But you want to pull it up so that this end is flush with that end, with the spirit level there. And then once you set it with this screw, you then come to the other end and make sure he's pulled up to the point that he's level. So you shouldn't see any air gaps underneath the, the spirit level. It should be level all the way across. Okay, so you can see now we've got it nicely patched up top there. And I've gone ahead and put the plate on for the sconce light. And we just have my level up there just to make sure that it's nice and level. And a few minutes later we have our new LED sconce light up. This is kind of a cool modern design where it's just some kind of uh, glass elements there. But it looks really modern. Okay, so we're ready to patch up the wall, but I just wanted to show you um, how well this worked out for us here. So we grab the end of the wall here and try to move it, and you can see it barely moves. It's rock solid. It maybe moves an eighth of an inch, whereas the other day you could see we were able to easily sway this wall an inch in either direction. It was just unbelievable. So just a quick review and a step back to look over all of the things we did. We mounted that threaded pipe into the flange and connected it to the floor. And then uh, we put another flange at the other end of the threaded pipe and ran it through some wood here to get to our top plate here. And our top plate is also screwed in in several places on both sides of the wall. It's screwed directly to the drywall. And that also helps solidify and controls torsion and twisting and bending in, in a couple of different planes here. So remember I was able to show you before we could bend this in. Well, you can't now. It's all rock solid. It doesn't, doesn't budge. And this one here was even worse. I could really squeeze this one before. He's rock solid also. So all we have to do now is just uh, put one on, up in the top. And we'll be ready to stick our drywall on here. And then our granite slab will go right here. And you can also see, like I said before, on the other side, we had the drywall screws as well. So... All of these things tying into each other, the blocking, is what, what helps a lot too. And just a reminder, if you go to do this yourself with, your, with a threaded pipe, use the one inch pipe. I think you'll get even better results than, than we got with the half inch. And make sure you put PL adhesive on the threads before you insert it into the base here. And then after you put it into the base, make sure you smooth the PL all the way around it there just to make sure that there, it can't wiggle around down there in those cracks. So now we're ready to patch it all up and make this look like a nicely finished kitchen here. Okay, so in preparation for plugging up this hole again with the drywall, I've put in some wood backing. This is how we normally do our drywall. So you screw it in through the front that goes into the wood that holds the wood into place. And then we put the drywall there and you remember earlier I mentioned not to throw away the piece that we cut out of there so here it is with, a, with my little put a little screw in it so I can help manipulate it a little better and just put it right back where we found it see that so now all we have to do is run some tape around it and then we'll go ahead and mud and feather it out So now we're getting ready to apply the corner bead here to this corner of drywall that we're working on. And you can see we've already got some other up there. So today what we're using is this stuff here. And this is the white plastic corner bead. So this is the other type of corner bead that you'll typically see people use. It's either plastic or the metal type. The metal type, of course, you can either staple or screw it into place. This here, this is the plastic. This gets put on with an adhesive, so it's a lot easier for people that don't want to do any drilling or stapling into the wall. And for that, you use this 3M here. It's a corner bead adhesive. So this is made just for doing this plastic here. And of course, you get a better bond if you spray it up onto the drywall first, right along the corner, all the way up. And then we're going to spray it right here on the inside of the corner bead all the way down here, like that. And I've got one already 
already attached up here at the top. So if you can see where there's a little bit of red here, that's a little bit of overspray from where we spray the adhesive. So this piece is going to go all the way across the window. Now, what happened originally was, you know, this was where, all right, so this right here is where the wall ended. Remember, it used to come straight down here before we made this a knee wall and we cut it down to half height. So we were going to end the quarter bead here, but if you end it here, it's going to stick out a little bit too much, I think, from the existing drywall corner that ended here. So what we decided to do was just go ahead and extend it all the way to the end anyway. And we'll just, when we go to tape, or, you know, you mud over it, you just go right along the edge. It'll take you an extra minute, but it'll look a lot smoother. And you won't have to worry about matching the difference in thickness of this corner bead to the existing drywall there. But anyway, you can see we spray the drywall first, and then we spray the corner bead second. And you try to do it all within a minute. I don't like to let it rest more than a minute up there before I add the corner bead. So we're going to spray the corner bead here now. Just lay it on there nice and thick. Here we've sprayed the drywall corner there already on both sides of it and you want to let both of them sit for about a minute before you apply pressure to put the corner bead into place. Alright so let's go ahead and put the corner bead into position here and I like to kind of push in along the rib just all the way down make sure that the thing is in place. So at the bottom and at the top, it should be nice and snug against the wall here. So I just kind of give it a good push in. And it'll sort of twist itself back into place there as you work your way up to the top there. And I always make sure that both of these ribs line up. And see how the, the pieces meet up at a 45 degree angle there. And then we'll come back later and we'll just, I'll use my six inch knife for the first layer to get the mud on there. Then when I'm done, I'll come back with a nine inch knife that will feather it out even further out to here. So all you're trying to do at this point is to just make sure that this is up against the drywall all the way up and down. And in about 10 minutes time or so, it should be nicely cured. Then you'll be ready to go ahead and put the mud on. But just make sure that everything here stays nice and adhered to the wall. Okay, now of course you know the rule of thumb, right? You take your taping knife and put it up against the wall and the corner bead there. And when you look straight down, you should see just the slightest bit of air through there, a little bit of light, just a nice little slot. Because what you're doing when you go to put the mud in here is the mud is going to build up to the level of this rib. So when you get it on there fully, you'll maybe see just a little bit of the, the white poking through and that's it. Okay, and then you also check the other side as well. You got to check both sides so that when you look down there, you should see just a little bit of a crack to let a little bit of light come in through there. So you check it in several places going up and if it's not right, then you got to keep playing with this and keep pushing these sides back in here to tighten it back down once you've moved it. So you basically have about a 10 minute working time to move this thing around before it starts getting solid. Okay, so at least right now, this wall is already starting to look better now that we're not seeing the bare cut edge of the drywall anymore. All we're seeing is a nice perfectly straight edge. So now let's go ahead and put some in on this other side here. side. I doubt the corner bead will reach there, but it's always good to have some on there. 
I'll put some on this side too. Now we're going to apply the second bead here on this side and the same thing I like to push in at a 45 degree angle first from the, the bead just to make it kind of get into place and then we make sure it's all straight and everything and then we push in on at the same time going up on both sides with your fingers just push it right into the drywall there. And now in this particular one here, we purposely didn't cut the 45 degree angle to show you how to deal with this particular case. Like what happens? Oh, what if I didn't know to do 45 degree angler? Well, it's not the end of the world, but we'll show you how to patch around that in case you forget. And we're going to be just allowing this to sit there a few more minutes and then we'll come in and tack it down again. So you can see here, if you look real closely at the channel that's being formed here, it starts at this bead, it goes in a little bit, maybe close to an eighth of an inch, comes across and it comes back out again. So our goal when we go to add the mud here is you see you see how the, the channel is formed in there? We're gonna fill that little channel there with mud as we go up with our taping knife and go like that. So that when we're done, this will all of these holes will get covered and um, it'll be nice and smooth. It should be perfectly smooth when we're done. Only the slightest amount of sanding will need to be done. Okay. By the way, I just wanted to remind you here, you don't have to spray both the drywall and the plastic. You can get away with spraying just the plastic by itself, but you do get a better and stickier bond by doing both. I always like to do both. It's not really hardly any extra work at all. And if you ever get any minor kinks or bends in your in your uh, corner bead, it's best to have that extra sticking power uh, of having both sides sticky and pulling towards each other. Okay, so now I've put the top one up there now. So you can see we got them all. Their beads are lined up here. But see what happened? Remember I told you we didn't put the 45 degree angle there? So this guy is here, he's got his 45. He's like, hey, wait a minute, I showed up. Where were you, what happened? So all we're gonna do is we'll patch up in here with some more of this green tape here and we'll just cover everything over with mud. Now, a lot of times we notice the bead will try to separate from the wall a little bit. So, you know, for about 10 minutes or so till it really sets up, you gotta keep coming back and just kind of hold it down. Uh, a lot of times I'll use my trowel knife uh, come by here and just force it against the wall there. Okay, so we've got our mud mixed here, and I'm just going to take my... What I do is I just sort of apply it with the smaller knife here. Then I'm going to come by with my 9-inch taping knife and make sure that there's enough sticking out so that when you come by and, and flatten it out, it'll stay flat, see? Kind of like that. And then we'll scrape off the excess, smooth it out a little, and there'll be minor amount of sanding when it's dried. So I've used the 9 inch rear here going all the way up the wall there so you can see it's reasonably smooth there. Now we'll start coming down the sides here. Alright, so we've applied some of it here sideways here with the smaller taping knife. Now I'm just going to take it and drag it down. And we'll go ahead and just clean all of this off here. And so you can see we've pretty much got this whole side and the front face here of the, the corner bead all covered up with our first layer of mud. And of course we are nowhere near as smooth as our other friend in the business, uh, Paul Peck. And if you guys haven't been to his video channel over on, here on YouTube, I'll put the link to the to his channel down below. You gotta go see Paul Peck drywall and painting man. He's this guy's probably the best out there. He's located a few hours north of us. He's up in Daytona, and he's got tons of videos on there on how to up your game on you know skimming and doing drywall mudding and stuff like that. And uh, 
you should spend some time over there watching some of his videos that he'll train you real well on how to do this kind of work here well now that we've put our drywall mudding all along all of the uh, corner beads here we've got our first layer down and we've got it all sanded so now we're just going to add a second layer this time we're going to feather it out further with our nine inch taping knife and so as we come around this side here and check out this side of the wall too so you'll see here we'll feather out nine inches to the left there and then all along above here but so far it looks nice and clean so let's go ahead and get that done now so the builder's wall was a little bit curvy anyway so that's not no big deal what we do is we'll just glob it up real good in this area here and try it down good with the nine inch all the way up to the corner here. Okay, so I've globbed some on the wall right here. And I've got my nine inch taping knife and I'm just going to put it right up in here into a small area for you to show you. I'm going to put it almost parallel to the wall and just drag it down real tight. See, so you can see how it'll kind of level out some more. we got to, you know, obviously put more in there. And because uh, there's a huge bump out right in here from the builder, so you just it's best to just glob it on the whole way down the wall here and then give it one good drag down the wall with your taping knife. And a few minutes later, we've got it all feathered out with the nine inch taping knife. Now it looks a lot more flatter. And when this dries, we'll give it a nice little sanding coat, and we'll see if we need to go out 12 inches or not. All right, so we've completed the painting on our knee wall and all of the area that we patched and mudded wherever we added the uh, drywall bead there, the corner bead. So this is looking nice now. It's starting to match the rest of the wall. So once we get this granite piece on here, it's going to look just primo. So remember, this all was enclosed before. This was just a wall. And isn't it so much better to walk in the front door and look all the way through the foyer and all the way through the dining room here and straight into the kitchen and through the window beyond the kitchen and all the way out and all the way up the street, you can see now. So this is a very classy looking kitchen that we've worked so hard on. And the results are finally starting to pay off. Well, here we are the day after painting, and today is good news day, folks, because today our granite has arrived. So let me show you here what the granite guys did for us. So this is called Built Up. So they built it up to double the height so they can give you this, this thicker-looking counter here. And then they give you this plywood here that goes inside that pocket that they've cut in there. So what they want us to essentially do is take this loose piece of plywood here, mount it on top of our wall, and screw it down. And then we can glue the granite right on top of this so the granite will fit right over this once we connect it here to the countertop. So we'll just mount this on top. We'll make sure everything looks close to level and that it's in the middle of the counter here, so equal distance on both sides. And then when we get it into the position that we like, um, we want to make sure we have caulk under there. Actually, we're not going to... Yeah, so we just put uh, some of the PL adhesive on there. Just put globs of it down there. And then, so what we're going to do with this is, you know, we always glue and screw whenever we're dealing with wood like this. And uh, putting it on a little bit extra thick like this will also help us in case we need to level that piece of wood that the granite guys gave us. So let's take a look at it. All right, so the board is now um, glued down, and we'll screw it down into the uh, plywood here under it. Uh, so as you can see underneath, we still have like you know some gaps. Once it screws down, this should pretty much seal up. But we'll come back in with PL afterwards, after the fact, and we'll just get a bead going all the way down in here, and we'll force it in on both sides. And this stuff will never come up, no matter what you do. You'll be having a massive fight on your hands trying to get this thing ever to come back up. Okay, so now before we apply our adhesive, I want to dry fit it and put the granite on here just to make sure that everything fits, because I don't want to start gluing it and have all of that mess to deal with in case... 
we find out that we have to move it for some reason. So we started to fit the granite over it, so you see how it just forms like a U-channel, and it goes wraps right around this plywood piece here. And then we just pull it in towards the wall like that, see? So we'll take a look around and make sure everything looks okay. And if we're happy with it, then we'll go ahead and glue it down. Okay, so now that we're happy with that, we go ahead and we've put some PL adhesive here on the top. And so now we're going to finally set the granite into its final resting place forever. So we've got it up here, and just like before, we'll drag it all the way up against the wall. Now it's nicely cemented in. It's not going anywhere. So here we are with the granite on top. So now the only thing we need to do is we got to deal with this issue here that you can now see the wood and everything here. So we have a decorative molding we want to put along in here. So we'll have to take some measurements here to see what we want to do. It'll probably be a, a double decker type of stuff because you might have to have a quarter round right here to handle just this area going down there. And then you can put a wider one that maybe rests on top of the quarter round. The quarter round will come out here to meet it. And then the, the other, the other um, almost like a chair rail, a decorative chair rail will go right here. So you won't even see any of this crack. Okay. And then as I promised earlier, I went ahead and filled all of these cracks here with the caulk. The, uh, this is actually the PL adhesive. So you can bet this is not going anywhere. I felt sorry for whoever 30 years from now when they go to remodel decides they want to remove this thing because they're going to be in for the battle of their life. And another thing too here, if you notice, now that the granite is on here and everything, but even with all of our engineering fixes that we did to stabilize this wall, look at it. This thing is, I mean, it's barely, barely even budging. It's rock solid. So if you remember this wall, it's barely moving now. Before it was moving about an inch and a half in either direction. This thing was like swaying left and right. So this is way better now. It's absolutely perfect and rock solid. So now I've started dry fitting here some of the baseboard. Okay, and so I'm going to show you something that we find a lot when we're doing remodeling. As you can see, the builder left almost a three quarters of an inch gap because they tiled up to the other baseboards instead of tiling up near the wall and putting the baseboards on top. So what we do when we see these kinds of gaps is we kind of fill it in a little bit on a couple of spots. With you can use caulk or PL adhesive; it doesn't really matter which, uh, but. Um, that what that does is it fills in that channel and it makes it nice and level so now you have at least a little something to make it sit on see so now it sits in there and we're going to go ahead and get those brad nailed in make sure everything fits and then we'll come back and we'll caulk along the top okay so we just finished painting all of the molding pieces that we're going to put underneath the granite there to hide the wood and this is a nice um, Classy looking textured chair rail molding. All right, so we got this piece attached here. So you can see we've got our molding there running along the bottom there to cover up the wood. And then we had to use a quarter round piece here to cover up that bigger gap on the bottom there. So we'll get this all screwed in better. And when we're done, we'll have all of this caulked white and you'll never even know the difference. We'll have all of these covered up and it will look absolutely perfect.